Thank you, David, first of all, and thanks to all of you which are connected today. I will go directly into the topic, trying to keep to the deadlines. And thank you also for having the possibility to talk a little bit about what's happening also out of Italy, since I'm following what is happening at the international level on behalf of various organizations in the last 12 to 15 years. Just briefly about the Italian Composting and Biogas Association I'm working for, and one of the three senior experts there. We are somehow representing the industrial sector in Italy made of composting and biogas facilities whose main input feedstock is uh, food waste and garden and park waste, uh, just to define the boundaries. And our uh, members, our facilities and our members today represent almost 75% of the installed treatment capacity in Italy. Uh, so what we do, like other organizations, working together with local authorities, working on improving national legislation, adopting correctly EU legislation, and so on. This is usual business for any uh, association involved in waste management. Uh, three elements which we realized and we were focusing on guaranteeing the quality of recycling Italy regarding bio-waste were to realize a label for compost quality in about 20 years ago almost. Uh, in 2006, we were the first uh, uh, composting organization in Europe and worldwide launching its own certification scheme on compostable or biodegradable plastics. And I think this uh, will, we will get back to that uh, later on. And we have uh, a label to certify um, biomethane produced starting from waste and namely starting from food waste. Uh, just a few key data about Italy's recycling sector so that it can be comparable to the data that the other colleagues and uh, presenters will talk about today. Uh, to summarize the data quite easily, these are the last 20 years of a separate collection of organic waste in Italy, which is mainly made of food waste, and food waste represents almost 70% of these amounts, and some garden and park waste. We pass the psychological uh, value of 100 kilograms per person in a year uh, about five years ago. The system today looks, looks almost like this. So as I told you, two thirds of the amounts are food waste, one third is garden and park waste. They are collected separately and sent to recycling in a network made of composting facilities, roughly 270. Some of them are very small, but let's say the larger ones uh, are significant and belong to our association. And more recently, the biogas sector has gained momentum and about 50 biogas facilities are part of our association and do recycle roughly 50% of the organic waste, which is of the food waste, which is collected separately. Uh, a key element of the Italian strategy is that both uh, that anaerobic digestion is usually followed by post composting. So you will find what we called combo facilities, which are made of a first step of anaerobic digestion and afterwards composting. Uh, I won't bother you with legislation, but regarding the link between bio waste management and bioplastics in Italy, it's worth having. Uh, an overview of our uh, cornerstones or deadlines that we had in the last 20 years. Compostable plastics are part of uh, recycling organic waste in Italy since almost uh, 25, if not 30 years. Uh, in 2010, as David already mentioned, we got a very fundamental law which basically obliged the use of compostable bags for organic waste collection which means either the bags are compostable or you don't use any bag. But the, the reason or the rationale behind this law is that the bags must be as compostable as, it, as their content. Uh, uh, one year later, Italy was, I think, among the first countries in Europe introducing a ban on traditional polyethylene shoppers. And uh, again, these two laws uh, combined should make households available, easily available, uh, compostable liners and shoppers to be used for separate collection. And since last year, Italy's experienced the impact of the single-use plastic directive, 
and today they are on the market that there is a large variety of compostable items going beyond shoppers and bags and addressing all kinds of compostable packaging, especially for uh, food. Uh, regarding the connection between food waste collection and compostable plastics, I will try to briefly summarize our experience starting from pictures. Uh, you can find today in Italy um, cities with separate collection of food waste, which are from north to south and with very, very distinctive features in time of temperatures, in times of density of inhabitants. And what you can see here are just some of the cities I selected because I worked in most of them in the last 20 years. One is Europe's best metropolitan area in terms of food waste collection. One is our zero waste champion, the city of Palmers, and so on. Uh, I just want to point out that we successfully collect food waste also in very uh, high climatic condition, like in the southern part of Italy. Well, a first question which arises is how can we achieve significant amount of food waste to be collected and sent to recycling in cities or high density areas where people live in apartments and flats? Uh, I will use an example to give you some numbers on that. City of Parma, typical Italian situation, medieval town, narrow roads, uh, a lot of tourism, a relatively large university compared to the residents' population and uh, a scheme which was adapted in the last 15 years. What we learned in trying to collect food waste in Parma is that some schemes work better than others. Remarkably, door-to-door -door collection work better than bring schemes. These are just some of the typical buckets and bins we used to collect food waste at household, at single households, or at apartments in the Horeca sector, so restaurants, canteens, uh, food, uh, food shops, and so on. I think numbers are very often much better in explaining results than schemes or other details. This is an assessment I have done for Parma about five years ago, comparing their former bring scheme for food waste collection with their uh, actual curbside collection scheme. And what you can see very clearly is that the scheme is more effective in rising the amount of food waste collected and at the same time it lowers the amount of impurities, which would interfere with the good functioning of composting or biogas facilities. The second question, which I tried to prepare addressing it to our audience today is, do households separate their food waste regularly or not? And what are the key elements for this success? Well, first of all, let me give you an answer based on the results of the city of Milan. Milan is Italy's capital city, roughly 2 million inhabitants. Uh, when we launched the scheme in 2012, uh, we were able to assess some results a couple of years later. Today, we know that without households, we cannot make it. Households make up almost 86%, uh, makes up almost 70% of the food waste which can be collected separately. Uh, we know that nobody is perfect, it's roughly 14 to 15 percent still goes into the residual waste scheme. That's fine for us. Uh, we know today, I've looked at the data before this presentation, the updated quantities say that a city like Milan, so a metropolitan area like London or Milan, is able to collect 150 kilogram per habit, uh, tons per, habit per, per year of food waste. Uh, speaking in terms of residents, it's roughly something near to 110 kilogram per person a year. So it's a significant amount. To reach, to get to this level, uh, we uh, made a customer satisfaction uh, a few years ago, trying to ask customers, so residents in Milan, how satisfied they are about the new collection services, uh, which included uh, food waste collection, which was new for Milan people and which were, they were not used to until, until 2014. What we see is that, first of all, the satisfaction is rather high. 80 out of 100 inhabitants are satisfied with the scheme. And if we ask these people which are satisfied, if they participate regularly or daily in sorting their food waste into the right bin, well, we see that almost 90% 
key to that scheme. So the outcome, which we knew from smaller towns and cities, has been confirmed also in high-rise areas that the scheme can be designed in a um, um, customer-friendly way. And one of the key elements to make that is having, first of all, kitchen caddies with compostable bags. And since you're all from the sector, you know that compostable bags are, can be made of paper, or in the Italian case, 97 out of 100 bags which are used by households are compostable bags and liners. We know from our uh, waste composition analysis activity that the Italian composting organization does yearly. Yearly we analyze between 1,000 and 1,500 different samples of food waste which are delivered to the facilities of our members. So the numbers are again significant. Well, in 2011, we tried to uh, see how the quality of food waste changes according to the use of plastic bags, so PE bags, or compostable bags, so uh, bioplastic certified compostable bags. And in terms of physical impurities, the results uh, confirm what we knew from spot analysis. So we know that the bag somehow makes the quality of the sorting and helps people to be aware what to sort into the food waste bin and what not to throw into it. Uh, I must say that the use of kitchen caddies and compostable bag is not a recipe which belongs to Italian only. It has been now adopted quite uh, widespread over Europe at least and I just took some pictures of different cities which are more or less well known. And again, you can see that all start by making the scheme user friendly, friendly and compostable by adopting what we called a vented system, a vented and compostable system. Uh, before entering my panorama over Italy, I was trying to give an answer to a third question, uh, which came out from my activities mainly in Central Europe uh, together with some German experts and colleagues. And the question which I prepared is, what happens in a city where bio-waste has been collected for many years or for decades, and now we deliver to households free of charge kitchen caddies and a set of compostable plastic bags? Well, this is what happened and what was done and realized by some of our German experts and colleagues in 2015 in Velamar. For those who don't know, know that, uh, Velamar is one of the areas which had separate collection of food waste since almost 20 years. They had some issues to perform better because 60% of the bio waste was collected still in the residual waste stream and they had a problem with rejects or impurities. So what we did is we equipped them, they were equipped with the right tools and we can learn two things from this experience. First of all, contamination of bio waste by using compostable liners doesn't screw up, it goes down. Uh, the data uh, in this case go from 7% rejects or contaminants up to 3%. And the other thing we learned is these new tools helped households in high-risk buildings remarkably better to sort their food waste than households living in detached or semi-detached situation, which means there was much more food waste not sorted in flats before. And now, thanks to these tools, these households perform remarkably better. Uh, final question, uh, because this is, pops up every time we talk about compostable items, which are not food and garden and park waste. The fear is they are not compatible with industrial composting or other facilities, and they end up in compost. A couple of years ago, the Italian Composting Organization, together with other organizations, which are basically the, the Italian extended producer responsibility scheme for plastics and the, let's say, the equivalent of BBA in Italy, which is bioplastics, uh, also bioplastiche, uh, put themselves together and we made a national survey which lasted about one year, uh, selecting 27 facilities which are able to treat up to 2.5 million tons of food and garden waste. So they were highly representative of the Italian recycling sector. Coming to the conclusion, we did a year of analysis, waste composition analysis, compost analysis, analysis on the digest state. And what comes out is today we know exactly that in our food waste, we have 
significant amount of flexible plastics, so bags and packaging for food waste, and some rigid plastics. We also went for the first time systematically looking at what kind of rejects or plastics we find in a compost, because we know that there is some plastics in compost, and our analysis on these amounts uh, treated show that there's zero compostable plastics in the final compost, which means that the composting process is compatible with the compostable plastics, which are collected together with food waste, at least in Italy. And of course, the rejects are still a problem because impurities in food waste do affect the recycling efficiency thanks to the dragging effect. So our Mark, conclusions were... Good. I'm bringing you to the conclusions. Thank you. Yes, I am at the conclusions. Liners and caddies, compostable liners and caddies, allow, in our experience, to increase separate collection of food waste. Italy makes use of these kinds of tools since more than 25 years, and compostable plastics and bags are accepted as a standard procedure at Italian composting and biogas facilities. Uh, not surprisingly, we developed our certification scheme to tackle this sector and to, to the composting sector and the bioplastic sector and to help it to grow in a way it is compatible with our facilities. Thank you very much for your attention. Marco, thank you. Now, uh, Alison, I can't see uh, questions coming in, but maybe that's because there are none. Um, or maybe because I, I can't work out the control panel properly. Um, but Marco, there was one slide there I want to go back to just quickly. Um, and that was the amount of compostable plastics that you found in uh, compost or in digestate before compost, I believe. It was one, about 1%, 1.4%. Is that correct? Yeah. And yes. what that means is that in some, in some AD facilities, you're getting a, a 99% breakdown, and others you're getting a 100% breakdown. Is that correct? Uh, I, well, I, I think uh, regarding the breakdown, we focused on compost only, maybe regarding anaerobic on the digestate, uh, Wilbert will be sure. a okay. better title to speak. For sure, on the, the whole compost we analyzed, we couldn't we could find plastic elements as you can see in this picture but we did an analysis in laboratory uh, to verify that these were compostable plastics or not so the message is the plastic helped to collect food waste correctly clean and once they are delivered into our facilities they don't survive the treatment process so they will not end up in uh, uh, giving a visual contamination to the final compost for sure. Thank you. That's clear. Thank you very much, Marco. Now, I would ask you if you mute your, um, your microphone, Marco, um, and mm -hmm. if we can work out the, the chat panel later, then we'll, we'll come back to you with questions. Um, meanwhile, it's my, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Robert Smeets. Robert is a Dutchman who has been living in uh, northeastern Italy and running the plants there for uh, some 20 years now, I believe, Robert. Um, and uh, one of the, I think, possibly one of the biggest uh, food waste operators in the world. Uh, doing both anaerobic digestion and composting. The floor is yours, Wilbert. Thank you. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm glad uh, to be with you and to present uh, our composting facilities. And um, I'm going to show you how, the, how we work and what we do and uh, what is the important thing to have clean and good material to compost. Um, we are running several facilities uh, with a total amount of uh, 885,000 tons of years of uh, bio waste, food waste. Um, we, here we have uh, this, the facilities Cesar, Agilux, Bioman, and Berica. These are facilities with uh, digestion and composting. And then uh, we have uh, excuse, uh, me, me, with, excuse me, to to you. Can you, can Ricardo or Roberto, can you move the menu bar? to the right, please, because it's blocking your slides. We can't see your slide. You have to move, the, just click the orange arrow, the orange, uh, la freccia arancia. Click, click la freccia arancia. Freccia arancia, this one. Yeah. yeah, click that. Thank you, and then clo that, that closes, that should close it. Or move okay. it, or just move it, or just move it to the side. Just, just yeah, click on it and move it to the side. Because it's blocking the slide. Okay, now. No, it's, it's it's that's that, that's good. That's good. Now it's good. Thank you. Great. Okay. I have to go back. 
Okay, now you see everybody? It's okay now? David? Everything good. Hello? Yeah, you hear me? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Here you can see our facilities. We have uh, Cesar, Agilux, Bioman, and Birica. These are all facilities that treat bio waste with digestion. And uh, only Cesar and Biomass, they have also composting facilities, uh, aerobic and anaerobic. Uh, then we have another three facilities where we treat only uh, green waste. But these are the, the important, uh, most important facilities where we treat uh, organic waste from uh, uh, collection, household waste from uh, separate collection. And in these uh, facilities, not all, uh, but in Bioman and uh, in CESA, we have uh, bio waste input and green waste input for composting. The other facilities, we have only bio waste for digestion. Uh, the results of these facilities are electricity, thermal energy, because we do also shipping heating. We produce biomethane uh, for our own trucks to do the collection, and then we go also with the biomethane to the grid. We have CO2 production and the compost, of course, compost. And then at the end, uh, we have water. And this water we use um, in our facilities for the biofilters and also for the, for the, the green parts of the facilities to wash the trucks. All these facilities uh, don't uh, need energy from outside. That means the electricity we produce by ourselves and what we have in plus, it goes to the grid. That means also with the thermal energy, we um, we produce our own energy to uh, let run the facilities. That means no energy from outside is coming in. The only thing that we have at the moment are the um, <clears throat> wheel loaders, but uh, within next year, uh, also our wheel loaders are going on biomethane. Our process is we have the waste delivery, we have the G-Force. The G-Force, this is for the bio waste. The G-Force separates the organics from the uh, rejects. The rejects, um, we speak about 6%, we divided it immediately from the beginning. The bioplastics, they are soft and also uh, bio um, plates or something like the bio tools, they pass through this machinery and they go to the liquid fraction, we call it, and it goes to the anaerobic digestion. The rejects, we can see that there are metals, there are um, plastic parts, and it goes immediately uh, away from our facility. The liquid fraction goes to anaerobic digestion. Inside, you can see that we have still the bioplastics, but there are also some plastics inside. It goes to the digestion, and then from there, we produce the biogas, upgrading, electricity, and we produce the digestate. The digestate is going one part to the biological uh, treatment, wastewater treatment facility and one part is going to the composting facility where we add green waste. Here you can see the delivery point of the trucks where we uh, unload the trucks in a bit. Um, immediately the trucks, we wash them with the waste uh, water that's coming out of our wastewater treatment facility. Here you see the green waste and here you see our bio waste, kitchen waste. And you can see also a lot of uh, bioplastics and these bioplastics are not creating any problems inside our facility. And you can see also that like Marco did, uh, as told before that the bioplastics after the, the process, they are not, uh, you can't find them anymore. So they are completely transformed in the compost. Here you see our facilities. Um, with the bin, we take out the material, it goes to the uh, G-Force, where we do the, uh, the first, um, cleaning of the material and 95% uh, of the organics, that are all organics is going to the digestion and the rejects are between three and 5% and uh, that's then going to or bio drying or immediately to landfill or incineration. Digestion, um, here you see our digesters, we have um, uh, digesters, they are, 12 meters high. The substrate is uh, coming from the top. We have a mixer. We work with uh, 52 degrees, uh, thermophile digestion. Biogas is produced, it's going out of the top. We have a mixing uh, with a central mixing. And at the site we have uh, where we uh, heat up the, the, the liquid, 
with the heat exchangers out, not inside the digester, but outside of the digester. Unloading the digester, we clean the digestate afterwards. In the beginning, we have a first cleaning with the G-Force, where we take uh, the discrete to 5% out. Uh, the settling, uh, by settling and by uh, screens, we clean the digestate afterwards, after the digestion, because in the beginning, the viscosity is very high and it's very difficult to separate. After digestion, the liquid is uh, much more liquid. Uh, we have also from 16% in the beginning, it's going down to 5 to 6% of uh, solids inside. That means it's much more easy to clean it afterwards. We have settled the mental tanks and screens. And after that, we have a digestate that goes to the composting. Because in Italy, we need to compost the digestate. We can't go immediately to the agriculture. Everything is controlled by control room. Um, this is also very important to have a good process. Um, you see here that at the moment three people are uh, sitting there, but normally uh, the system is working by itself. It's a system that works 365 days a year, 24 hours, 24 hours operation. And that means that we, have, we need a good software and hardware to run these facilities. 85% of our organics is water and we bring it back to the water. So after digestion, we clean it, we screen it, and um, the 75%, 80% from uh, the remaining is going to the wastewater uh, treatment facility where we have uh, an MBR. We have a nitrification, denification, and then we have the ultrafiltration over here, and then the osmosis inverse, and then we have clean water. This clean water, we need to, to, to wash the trucks, and uh, what we have in plus goes to the grid. We have an uh, agricultural water grid where the agri agriculture can use the water and in, in, in the summer it's very important in this area. The solids, that means uh, the, after the digestion we have uh, solids, uh, it's uh, 7% and with 80% of water. That is going to the composting facility where we mix it up with green waste. And then after 90 days of composting, we take it out and screen it. We have a very, very clean compost. You can see it here. One part is pelletized and we sell it uh, up to 75 and 100 euros per ton. And we have uh, compost. It's uh, from five to 25 euros per ton, we can sell it. It goes uh, one part. Uh, we have a lot of vineyards in this area. Uh, we have also asparagus. We have uh, melons where they use uh, this compost. At the end, output uh, from uh, the digestion, we have uh, engines to produce the electricity for our, for our own consumption. Uh, about 30% is own consumption and 70% is going to the grid. Then we need also the thermal energy. The thermal energy we need uh, for the district heating. We have uh, more than uh, 75 uh, Houses connected and industry connected to our grid. We need uh, we use it to uh, heat up the offices. We have also greenhouses where we grow uh, flowers and of course the process digesters. Here you see the, the greenhouses that we have at the side of the, the facility where we produce the flowers. And here we go up to a biomethane process. Uh, we have a biomethane process um, where we produce the biomethane to run our trucks to do the collection. And uh, this is the process where you see we use membranes to separate uh, the CO2 from the uh, methane, from the biogas. This is a very important uh, issue for us now. So uh, the collection, what we do, we do it all with our uh, trucks, all running on biomethane. Then we have uh, CO2 that's, uh, that we get back. One part is going to the food industry. We have it already food graded. And uh, one part is going to the technical industry. So that means everything is uh, recycled, the CO2 and also the CH4 biomethane. OK, it's blocked. I think that I had explained. I more, yeah, I think you're more or less finished there, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 
Listen, there's, 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 one, there's, there's one question I wanted to ask you, and maybe also, Marco, you would like to chip in on this. And the, the question that people ask me in the, in the UK is, well, why do you treat your digestate? Why don't you just put your digestate uh, to soil directly? I mean, it's, after all, it's, it's, it's rich in uh, nit uh, nitrogen, um, and um, you know, the, it's, it's rich in water. So why don't you just put your digestate to soil? Surely, this treating of digestate costs a lot of money. Um, yeah. And isn't it, isn't it cheaper to just put it to soil? Why don't you do that? Okay, the distribution in Italy is not uh, allowing us, it's not an end of waste to digestate. Uh, compost is an end of waste, water is an end of waste, but digestate is still not an end of waste. Uh, our, we have also agriculture facilities where we use uh, crops and um, chicken manure poultry, uh, where we can go immediately with the digestate to the agriculture. But digestate from waste is uh, not, at the moment, not possible to go directly to the agriculture. And that's why we are composing it. And that's why it's going to the wastewater treatment facility. Yep. Shall I add something on that, David, very briefly? Uh, fully in line with what uh, Wilbert is saying. In addition, there are some distinctive features which a compost has compared to a um, digestate, which should be taken into consideration. Digestate is an excellent organic fertilizer. Compost is a soil amendment, and so there are some issues regarding the benefits on soil, long-term benefits like carbon storage, carbon sink, amelioration of the content of organic carbon, which ought to be overseen on that. And of course, Italy, Italy's legislation forces us to do anyway compost. And we are very pleased with the situation, I must add. Yes. Um, last question for you, um, uh, both Marco and uh, and Wilbert, before we, we leave Italy. Um, and and that is around the costs. Um, here in the in the UK, uh, AD and composting facilities have very, very low gate fees, uh, sometimes as low as zero. Um, and therefore, their, their, their income is based uh, upon the sale of the energy uh, and upon the incentive they get for the production of that energy. Um, a calculation has been made here that the, the cost of treating food waste is roughly in the region of 65 euros a ton. So the, the energy sale and the energy incentive has to cover that. But in Italy, of course, you have a gate fee as well as the energy sales. And, and, and presumably it's that gate fee which allows you to do all, the, all of this. I started, Marco, okay. Um, Composting, of, of course, has an additional cost, uh, cost of energy, cost of um, front and loads that have to, to, to run the materials, you have to screen it. And it's, of course, much more uh, cheaper to go immediately to uh, the agriculture. Um, if you compost, you need to add, I think, 35 euros per ton, at least 35 euros to compost the digestate. If you go directly to the agriculture, I think with five euros per ton you can handle it. But so it's um, it's an additional cost. If you go to the wastewater treatment facility, it costs you about 25 to 30, 30 euros per ton. So it's a uh, very high cost and very high operational cost. And also um, the composting and uh, the, um, the the wastewater treatment facility consumes more than 35 percent of the energy that you produce. So the grid, the, 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 what you send into the grid, you have to take away another 35% of energy. So that's lowering also that part. If, if I may add just briefly, uh, recycling activities can't be for free in this sector. Uh, regarding Italy, yes, our gate fees range between 65 euro per ton. That was was you was mentioning, David, and they reach in some areas 90 euro per ton. The important point are two. First of all, the gate fees are still significantly lower than disposing residual waste. We are talking now in northern Italy. I am living in near to Verona. I'm living in Verona uh, or near to Milan are roughly 140 euro per ton. So there are still significant savings on that side for municipalities to recycle organics instead of collecting them together with residual waste. Besides the fact that Italian legislation requests our cities to reach at least 65% recycling, which means that without food waste, you cannot go there. 
So in that, we anticipated European legislation almost 10 years ago. Sure. Okay, Marco. Well, and, and Robert, thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, if, I can, if I can find questions on the chat later, uh, please stay with us uh, and I will come back to you. Uh, Marco okay. and Robert, can you please now mute your microphones? Both yeah. of you. David, just to thank say you. there has been quite a few questions come in. Are you going, are we going to... Yeah, I, I don't quite know how to see them, but um, maybe you can, yeah, but I will look for that while Suzanne is speaking, okay? I will okay, look for the question while Suzanne Facebook. is speaking, and maybe, and maybe you can help me do that. Um, oh. now let me introduce uh, Suzanne Lindenegger, who is a technical advisor for waste issues at the city of Copenhagen. Welcome, Suzanne. Um, and uh, Suzanne will tell us how uh, Copenhagen City has now uh, begun its uh, food waste uh, collections. Welcome. Thank you. Um, just uh, wondering whether you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. You can. We can, we can see, yes. Uh, okay, good. Um, yes, we started just a few years ago collecting bio waste in the city of Copenhagen, and I will, um, I will tell you something about that. Uh, firstly, um, my name is Suzanne. I've been working in the city of Copenhagen for almost 10 years now. Um, and my responsibilities cover, uh, amongst others, uh, the bio waste. Um, and just to show you where we are, uh, we are in the capital of Denmark. It's a small place, a smaller place than many of the other cities we've been talking about already. Um, uh, we have only uh, around 600,000 inhabitants in, uh, in Copenhagen, in, uh, but, and most of those uh, live in flats. Um, and we have around um, 200,000 tons of household waste every year, and of course part of that is bio-waste. Um, to talk a little about our waste management, um, it's based on uh, on sustainability principles that uh, waste is a resource. Um, we have had, as you may know, for many years uh, relied and on incineration uh, for central heating uh, purposes in uh, for the waste in in Denmark it's been a cornerstone but uh, there is a trend now not just in Copenhagen but in the whole of, of the country to um, to move away from incineration and uh, towards more recycling um, when we talk about uh, doing that we have to team up with the with the citizens or the residents in our cities and uh, in our country as a whole because they need to sort the waste so that we can make the most of it when we collect it and afterwards um, our waste management strategies are very interlinked with um, our climate uh, goals in the city of copenhagen where we have a goal of becoming co2 neutral in uh, 2025 which is a very strong driver. Um, so that goes along hand in hand with a, with a high recycling rate. Yes, then of course, uh, as I implied before, uh, our system is based upon source separation uh, and the collection of many different materials. So we have bins for almost all kinds of waste, as you can see here. Um, and the bio waste is the latest of those uh, fractions. Uh, we started in uh, 15, collecting uh, from the single family households that uh, we, we have some 20,000 of those. And then in 17, we expanded the scheme to also cover flats. Um, I won't go into detail with the other uh, fractions. But before we introduced the bio waste scheme, uh, we made a waste composition analysis in uh, 2016 uh, before we made our new waste management plan or strategy uh, that goes on for 2024. I will show you some of the targets in that uh, in a sec, but uh, we wanted to find out the potential in the residual waste before we started the work. And here you can see that we had a, a large fraction uh, of the residual waste being organic, and uh, it showed a potential of more uh, than 50,000 uh, tons of bio waste a year. So it showed that there's, uh, 
if we want a high um, recycling rate, then of course we have to include the, uh, the bio waste as um, Marco also said before. Um, the waste management plan was adopted in uh, December of uh, 2018. Um, and the, the goal there is, um, is to uh, get a recycling rate of 70% in 2024. Um, you can see in the, the bars there in the middle that uh, only a few years ago uh, or 10 years ago, we, we was largely relying on the incineration, the 71% in the dark blue bar is uh, the incineration. And uh, that is going to swap. <laughs> to being um, um, recycling uh, in 2025. So we have a task, we are at the moment, uh, we have a recycling rate of just below 45%, which means that uh, we have a job ahead of us. When we introduced the, um, um, the bio waste in Copenhagen, uh, we of course uh, gathered um, uh, experiences from from other cities. Uh, I I went to Milan, for instance, to to look at how they do it there. So we introduced the new scheme by um, handing out the uh, baskets for kitchen baskets and uh, of course uh, also compostable bags. Um, before we chose the compostable bags, uh, we did a test to choose from uh, either paper bags or uh, these compostable. Um, plastic bags and, the, and the, the test showed that the citizens that we tested it with um, wanted the, the compostable bags, uh, more than 90% preferred the compostable bags to the paper bags. Uh, and I guess that's why, uh, that's the reason is, uh, one of the reasons is that it seems more reliable when you have to walk down the steps, uh, maybe from the fifth floor <laughs> to the bin in the yard or on the curbside. That, uh, that makes good sense. We collect the waste in uh, in a bin, a wheelie bin in the yard. Then it's taken to pretreatment. It's a, a paper pulper, actually. Um, it's uh, transformed into a pulp, of course, going to anaerobic digestion. Uh, the digestate is uh, applied to farmland as a fertilizer. Uh, it is not composted as in in uh, Italy, in Denmark, we have a regu regulation uh, that um, where there has to be uh, that has to be met with criteria of uh, of physical impurities and also chemical impurities and so on. Then on the farm from the farmland, food is produced to the city, and uh, the circle goes on and on. We hope. <laughs> um, in uh, 2017, when we introduced the scheme to, um, to the bigger part of the city, we, uh, we handed out 260,000 bio baskets and uh, 12,000 uh, wheelie bins. Uh, here you can see the pulp and also the reject. We did a, um, an analysis on the, on the reject and actually, we also looked into the plastic parts in the, the pulp a few years back. But in the in the reject, uh, you can see that uh, there is um, misplaced waste. It's um, packaging waste mostly, but it's also textiles. And then uh, most of it is actually uh, organic, that just organic stuff that didn't dissolve in the pulp. Uh, as I said, we did a test uh, on the on the bags beforehand, but uh, we also wanted a compostable bag or a bag that was not just a regular plastic bag, um, because we wanted to send a signal to households that they have to sp take special care uh, when sorting uh, the bio waste. And um, of course, because it is applied on the farmland and potentially uh, going into the crops. We also wanted to uh, avoid uh, microplastics when uh, the digestate is spread on farmland, uh, or at least to uh, if it if the digestate uh, contains some uh, 
uh, small pieces of the, of the collection bags than uh, to make sure that uh, it is biodegraded in a short time. At the moment, yes, you could see before, the bags are sorted out in the pretreatment and it's sent for incineration and uh, due to our link to the CO2 uh, emission goals in the city, um, it's a good idea to have plant-based uh, bags um, to reduce the emissions of fossil CO2. And then we have a procurement uh, process that uh, we designed uh, recently, and it is designed to ensure uh, biodegradability and also the uh, low fossil content, which is actually a challenge at the moment, I think. We are about 50% uh, of the bag is uh, still fossil based. I think that needs to improve. Uh, but in the future, we will change. Um, at least if it's possible with the Danish uh, system, we will change from um, uh, to, to anaerobic digestion instead of incineration of the reject. Then uh, here you can see how we did. Um, as you can see in the first two years from 15 to 17, uh, or at least if you can see it, <laughs> that's the small blue bars. Uh, that we didn't collect a lot of waste, but it's uh, as soon as we introduced the scheme in uh, September, August, September in uh, 2017, uh, the amounts uh, increased very fast. But then um, we had problems uh, increasing it further. And uh, this is not enough to meet a goal of 17% um, uh, collection efficiency in uh, 2024 and uh, a goal of 38,000 uh, tons, uh, we need to at least triple this. So uh, at the moment we are working on the collection side. Uh, we also work on the, on the other end of the, of the line. Um, we hope to be able to uh, produce protein or other chemical building blocks from uh, the bio pulp in the future. So we work on that. And I guess that was it from me. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Now, I'm, I'm beginning to see the, the, the questions here. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't read them very well, but um, the, the, the digester which you put to soil, I think one of the questions is, can you measure the digester, the microplastics in the digestate which you put to soil? Have you got any data on that? We did a survey a few years back with the uh, Danish university who is um, at the forefront of this um, um, in, the, in this topic. And uh, there is a problem on, of course, on measuring it, um, but they succeeded to find a method, uh, the treatment for the samples that, so that they could uh, see the microplastics. Uh, and they also have a, a good, um, a way of determining whether it's uh, the collection bags or if it's uh, other types of uh, plastic pieces that they find in the digestate. And um, it shows that is, there is, uh, of course, um, there's uh, microplastics all over our society. Um, so also in the digestate, uh, but it's it's only one to two percent of the, of the plastics that uh, uh, or has uh, the bio bags as the origin. Most of it uh, resembles very much uh, packaging, food waste, food uh, food packaging. So, so in other words, not 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 compostable. Most of it, mo most of it probably derives from the handling of foods in the kitchen uh, okay. or before that, uh, and it doesn't have anything to do with the treatment probably yeah. doesn't have anything to do with the treatment uh, or, or the process that, uh, that sure. the waste goes through. Yeah, yeah, okay, understood, all right. It's in the food itself, okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Suzanne. Um, and um, please stay online. Um, when questions come through, I'm trying to read them here um, and, uh, and I, will, I will get, oh yes, one question for you maybe. What is your, what is your overall cost in, uh, in um, Denmark. I mean, have you have you 
calculated your treatment cost for your food waste compared to going to incineration? Yeah, the treatment of uh, the food waste is um, a little lower than incineration. Uh, incineration costs uh, around uh, 60 euro per ton in, uh, in Copenhagen. And uh, the treatment cost for the bio waste is around 55. Okay. Suzanne, thank you. Please now mute your uh, microphone. Um, yes. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Teresa, Teresa Guerrero from uh, Catalonia. Um, and uh, I know she has more than two decades experience in, in uh, waste and food waste collection. Teresa, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. So I'm going to share with you some of our history in waste collection in Catalonia. For us that don't know the company, we are the public waste management agency of the government of Catalonia in Spain. Here you can see the geographical situation, our population, and we are divided in almost a thousand municipalities uh, in in 42, uh, 42 counties. So our the general numbers of uh, separate collection rate in Catalonia are this one that you, you can see on the screen. We have an on average a 42% of separate collection rate, but we have more than 200 municipalities doing that system that Marco mentioned as well, door to door system with a higher uh, highest uh, rate, uh, 64%, and four municipalities doing door-to-door door -door collection and also pay-as-you-throw um, system that is the most efficiency, if efficient that we have in Catalonia. So, um, looking at the whole cycle in generations, separate collection, treatment and compost, well, I want to, to say that the separate collection of bio waste beca became compulsory in 1993 in Catalonia, a long time ago. Now we are collecting 400,000 tons per year of bio waste. Uh, is is the general in, in all this in all the our territory? The people, citizens, can separate their bio waste. Where a small part that is more isolated uh, on the mountain, they can do uh, home composting. So I want to say some some key factors on bio waste separate collection because it's not uh, a lot of time to to share all our information. But I want to say that five points, and uh, I'd want to finish with a project. Uh, one important factor is the, the separation at home system is like in Italy they mentioned, the Marco and Bigman. We use as well that the combination of uh, compostable bags with aerated bin. And we can observe 5% uh, of losses of weight for weight water evaporation. Uh, we also can notice less odors, less decades, and more comfort at home. It's not compulsory, that system in Catalonia, but it's the core system that we mention and we promote. Uh, each day, more people are using that system. A second important factor I want to, to share with you is the quality of collection. As uh, I, we are doing as well as Marco said, uh, we, do, we do as well a lot of samples per year to characterize our food waste. Uh, we have this, I want to introduce the systems because the quality is very related with the system, the collection system. We have two main systems, street containers and door-to-door -door collection. We, uh, the most general system with the street containers are containers free, uh, with free access. But now we are starting to look at our containers with a really good uh, results, so we are working on that system, uh, restrict access to citizens to use the containers. And that could be a uh, future for our city. So we are really excited about the uh, results in that system. And also we have a uh, door-to-door collection with individual bins or 
and or bugs, both of them. For food waste, is always we use bins. Here you can see the average in 2018 we had in impurities. That's the total impurities we have in, in, on average in our in our food waste. And as you as you can see here, almost 40% of impurities are plastic, and 13% plastic bags. So reducing this quantity of impurities will will will, will increase a lot our quality. Here you can see some average date data about the two main systems we have, uh, open carbide systems or door-to-door. -door. We have uh, an average collection rate about 35% uh, in container system, but we have a 70% collection rate in door-to-door -door system. And here you can see as well the quantity, a quality is very different in one system or the other. We have more, a lot more municipalities doing curbside container system than door to door. And the, the, the first one system is the most com common in big cities. So we have to, to work on that. We want to achieve the results we have in door to door system in our system with containers is, is for that that we are that's that's why we are working on on lock our containers that's very important in catalonia especially in barcelona but it's in all catalonia it's very important the contribution of big generators like uh, hotel restaurants or food distributors so it's, it's one third of our food waste so we are working as well with markets, hotels, restaurants, hospitals, and when when they start working, the quality is fantastic and the quality is very high. So it's, it's a key factor in our system to work with that commercial activities. A lot of them are uh, include in the same collection system as the as household have, but oh, the the biggest ones are have a private system to collect but the final uh, facility could be public or private here you can see on the, the average uh, the map uh, the geographical situation of our 24 facil bio waste facilities for our anaerobic digestion and post composting because it's also mandatory in Catalonia compo to compost the bio waste sorry the bio the digest and the four anaerobic digestion are here the, the biggest one in the metropolitan area of Barcelona the quality is very important and uh, for especially in, in aerobic digestion we need a very strong treatment to remove impurities before treatment so the best quality input the less loss the less cost and the less inefficiency so we have to really work hard in improving the quality here you can see some system to remove the impurities uh, before treatment here you can see some uh, is, is a, a scheme relating to the treatment fees by impugning impurities because we have a mandatory order for the facilities that they need a fee uh, according to the graduated according to the, the quantity of impurities they, they have in the input so here you can see that the the, more, the highest fee is for the less quality so that's a motivation for municipalities to improve the quality because they they are going to reduce the cost and that's an important tool you know i don't know if some of you know this this uh, system we have a disposal tax but with a refund system in catalonia so the municipalities a commercial activities pay a treat a fee a tax sorry over the the fee they pay when they go to the they let them um, they send mixed waste to incineration or landfill we we 
recover all this money and we um, refund the money to the municipalities depending on the quality of, of and quantity of the bio waste. So that's a system to increase the cost of the final disposal and incineration uh, treatment and to decrease the cost of the bio waste uh, collection and treatment. So uh, since we Mm. Since, since we introduce our disposal tax in our system the, and, and a special or uh, yes a special uh, tax for separate collection of bio waste, we increase a lot our separate collection in Catalonia because the motivation was not only uh, environmental but also uh, economical. And to finish my presentation, I want to share with you. Uh, sorry, um, sorry. I, uh, a project, I sorry, yeah, a project named uh, Ceres in which we we make a, a test. We remove all of our plastic uh, way, uh, plastic bags in a, in a municipality named the Seurge in the Pyrenees in, in the north of Catalonia, and we deliver uh, compostable bags by handles at cashier compostal bags in, in, for fruit and vegetables, and reusable bags to remove all plastic bags in, our, in, in, this, in the area. And here you can see the increase of, of compostable bags entering in the composting plant because the, in that area we have a special uh, individually or a composting plant for this area, a small composting plant. Uh, we start with a 20% of uh, composting bags, and now we have 60% of composting bags. One year after the project that we uh, remove plastic bags for the uh, markets and supermarkets. And here you can see we, we measure the real degradation of compostable bags in our facility that uh, we achieve in four weeks. And we measure the quality of the compost at the, at the end of the process. So before the, starting the process, the quality of the compost is a quality name in Catalonia, B quality, it's the same in, in whole Spain, that is useful for farming. But we wanted to, to improve the quality of the compost to achieve the quality for organic farming. And we achieved it, we, the, the project was successful and we reduced the zinc, zinc and copper and we achieve the quality that we wanted to achieve. So, in summary, I want to say that the contribution of compostable plastic are positive in all the steps in the bio waste management cycle in Catalonia. So, Reza, thank you. Uh, you. You have had your, um, your video off, so we haven't been able to see you. Um, okay. But maybe you, would, maybe you would like to turn that back on now while I, I ask you a couple of questions. Um, and um, there you are. Thank you. Um, and uh, one of the questions from the from the audience is, how do you define what is a compostable plastic? I know the answer, but you have a standard for that that you can define what compostable define, plastic is. Uh, we have to. You have um, uh, it's, it's normalized. We have a uh, uh, the the you. Um, Norm, I don't know what's the. It's the one three four three two. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's uh, the definition of a compostal. We need a certification for that. It's not a. It's not uh, something that we can invent. <laughs> we need the certification to the, to to be sure that the pl the plastic bag is compostable. Okay, and your your compostable bags do they go to anaerobic digestion as well as to composting? And do they yes. break down? In, and do they break down? Do they do they decompose in, in anaerobic digestion as well as in composting? Depending on the pretreatment, if the quality is, is high and we can introduce food waste and the, with the bag into the digester, the, we won't have any problem. And, af, and as I mentioned, we after the digestion we compost, so we have. For sure, the plastic will be completely treated in our facilities. But the problem is sometimes that the, the compostable bag or the plastic bag can't uh, enter the process 
because we have to remove our other impurities and in this pretreatment we lost as well bugs so sure. that's we have to, that's the we problem. Have to it's not because it's, it's, yeah. if we can't uh, have the process the back into the process it's impossible for them to sure if it's, if it's very dirty you have to screen everything out yeah exactly yeah. okay all right um one question for all of you before i pass over to kathy nichols um and, and and this is for you in, in copenhagen suzanne and and and, uh, and robert in uh, in italy if you have other compostable packaging coming to you not bags uh, for example you have um i don't know compostable food uh, wrappers or you have compostable uh, trays uh, for example ready meal trays that are made out of compostable rigid compostables are they can they be composted are they being handled or do you, do you screen these and and do you reject these um, maybe Wilbert in, in Italy firstly, and then Suzanne and, um, and Teresa. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, I can see that all the bio, uh, biodegradable material, doesn't matter if it's bioplastics or it's cardboard or it's um, uh, plates, uh, we can see that everything, is comp everything will be composted. Um, the separators that we have, um they're, they're where we have a 35 millimeter screen you see that the uh, pulping them is passing through because they're they are salt water also before that we uh, separate it they go to big bins uh big uh, storage where they get wet and uh, the material when it's wet it's very easy to separate it the plastics they still have uh, they have structure so it's easy to get them out and uh, the organic uh, the bioplastics and uh, the bio uh, plates they pass through and then they go to digestion. After digested, I don't find them anymore. Um, but after digestion, we have still the composting. So we are 100% sure that everything that's uh, bio plastics uh, is getting compost. And Suzanne, thank you, Robert. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, due to our pretreatment process uh, everything that doesn't dissolve in the paper pulp is uh, screened out uh, at least in the collection from uh, from the households uh, we have for um, uh, municipal institutions a different uh, collection and uh, and it also takes um, uh, single use uh, but biodegradable um, uh, plates and forks and knives and stuff uh, from schools for instance but it goes to a different kind of uh, treatment where it's not screened out beforehand it's, it goes to uh, sort of a dry anaerobic digestion together with garden waste so we have two different kinds of treatment okay and in Teresa, is there anything Teresa, you wish to add yeah we we are discussing about that because now we is the same as uh, compostable bags if we manage them to enter in the process we don't have any problem to decompose them but sometimes in the pretreatment system we lost some of uh, loose sorry some of them that part so maybe we we will need to we will have to to read it something or treat as as food as um, green waste that we treat in the same facility but we um, make as red uh, before the mixture so now we are working on the best ways to to treat these um, compostable plastics thank you thank you marco did you have anything to add there or not just two very brief things because we have a very large audience today i think it's worth stressing the fact that first of all we need pretreatment very often due to impurities so non-compostable traditional plastics in very high schemes where we get less than one percent contaminants we don't need, need any pretreating and this would answer the, the the question 
uh, compostable plastic sorted out. They wouldn't in that case. Uh, second point is, I think it's important for the audience not to miss one point. We want to use compostable plastic because they maximize their content and their content are organics and organics produce biogas and produce compost. So even in the worst case, if we lose the bags themselves, we're talking about 10 grams of bags full of two kilos of food waste. And so in the worst case, even if we would lose them totally at the beginning through screening, for cleaning, uh, uh, it's a win-win situation because we want to get the organics into our facilities. That was it, what I wanted to stress. Thank you. I think that's important to stress. Now, we finished the going around Europe and we're going to come back to our, our, our beautiful little island here. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Nichols, who's Senior Advisor at the Environment Agency. I hope, uh, Cathy, that you are online. Um, and um, Cathy is not going to present any slides, but just to give us a, a talk about how the Environment Agency here, which is our national regulator in England, uh, is looking at the quality of food waste going into plants and looking at the quality of outputs coming from plants and going to soil. Um, Cathy, are you online? Well, near our home, we have a little communication breakdown. Okay. Well, Kathy, we'll come back to you. I, I, I can't hear you. Uh, we will come back to Kathy. <clears throat> Presumably, she will be back on online with us. Let me check. Let me check. Uh, Rebecca. Okay. Kathy will come back to us. Presumably now. Rebecca, are you online? Yes, I am. One moment. We're sorry for the room going a bit over time. The floor is yours. Great. Off you go. So, um, let's see if I can get rid of that. Can you see that all fine? Is that all? Oh, perfect. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's perfect. Great. I see you and the screen. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, um, just to kick off, I'm Rebecca Thompson. I'm the Senior Policy Manager at the Anaerobic Digestion and Bioresources Association. So we're the UK Trade Association for AD. Um, and we're sort of at this point looking towards the 2023 point where separate food waste collections are going to be implemented in the UK. Um, so just to sort of outline the real key objective here, we're looking at preventing the methane emissions we're getting from food waste going to landfill. Um, the first way to do that is, of course, reducing food waste. Um, but we're always going to get this, um, this fraction that does need to be separately collected and recycled. Um, AD is ready to use technology to treat this waste. Um, and what you're getting um, with AD is the prevention of the methane emissions um, and capture using that as um, renewable gas that's already compatible with existing infrastructure, so displacing the fossil um, natural gas. And then alongside that, the um, sort of added benefit of the nutrient recycling and organic matter back to soil through digestate. Um, and on top of that, that's obviously displacing um, carbon heavy uh, inorganic fertilizers. Um, so when we look at this sort of within our waste system, we're obviously looking at moving towards this real sort of principle of circular economy and AD is very much um, key to that. Um, so in the UK, within our um, fairly recently developed um, uh, resource, what's it called? Um, the resource strategy. Um, we have the food and drink material hierarchy outlining for organic waste um, what your optimal sort of prevention and treatment methods are. So, of course, prevention is first. And then when you come into recycling, um, it outlines that anaerobic digestion is your optimal technology, um, followed by composting, and then, of course, incineration, landfill, um, 
at, at the bottom of that hierarchy. Um, so looking at where we are sort of today, we've got um, 104 AD plants in the UK that take food waste. That's out of around, I think, 675 AD plants in total. Um, so, you know, already generating significant um, energy there and recycling nutrients and organic matter back to soil. Um, for food waste in particular, we've got a situation where the capacity for food waste plants is higher than the amount of food waste available. So it's already been mentioned really, but um, what that's leading to is very, very low or sort of zero gate fees. Um, and I think what used to happen where you, you were getting sort of fairer gate fees is that for your more contaminated feedstocks, such as your commercial waste, there was quite a premium on taking those. But because of this pressure pushing down the gate fee, that premium for taking um, your more contaminated waste isn't really there. So you're not getting that additional price for dealing with that contamination. Um, the sort of the fact that people aren't really being paid for treating this waste, obviously, as sort of David mentioned before, um, reduces the ability to focus on digestate upgrading. Um, of course, you know, we we do also have the sort of environment agency um, regulating all of the um, the end of waste and the um, sort of um, the the digestate um, quality protocols, and that's of of course very important. But what is different with um, with the industry here is that digestate sort of once it's been um, filtered and and um, meeting these end of waste standards, there aren't those post treatment processes um, to upgrade the digestate. Um, and then I also just wanted to mention that because of this um, sort of high demand for the food waste, um, you do get a lot of plants treating household food waste alongside commercial food waste. Um, and one thing to note is we don't actually have brilliant data on, on that composition at this point, and it's something we are looking into. Um, so recycling consistency, um, the, the new laws that are coming into force, they've been consulted on once and we've responded to that. Um, and the points that we really drew out regarding soil health um, were that biobags and awareness campaigns um, are really critical to reduce front-end plastic contamination and increase buy-in from residents to make sure that we are um, collecting as much food waste as possible um, and getting the plastics out of um, that waste stream. So we, we also raised the point that there is a need to um, look at innovations in um, digestic quality and upgrading because um, it's really vital that when we're looking at digestate as a product, it needs to be delivering that value back to soil um, and maximizing that value back to soil. Um, and another point that we did mention, because in the UK, um, how it's structured at the moment, there isn't any kind of post AD processing of digestate. If that were something that needed to be introduced, that any costs should be supported. Um, and that needs to be sort of integrated into any policy design. So looking at plastic contaminants, oh, um, looking at plastic contaminants to soil, um, this is obviously a huge environmental problem that we really need to get right. Um, it's 
it's really important that um, the food waste that is collected is being recycled in line with the food and drinks material hierarchy to generate both energy and return the nutrients back to soil. Um, ideally, you want these contaminants to be re removed from the supply chain before they're reaching plants, um, but that's not generally the case. Um, AD plants in the UK do have depackaging and filtering processes to remove these contaminants um, and meet the end of waste standards that we have. Um, it, what's particularly important with this sort of issue that we're looking at, um, you know, this doesn't remove everything and you do get those micro fragments and as things are being spread to soil um, over a period of time, where these contaminants remain, that will obviously have a cumulative effect. So it's really important that we tackle this issue. Um, and the use of bio bags in household food waste is a really important step in the right direction to remove plastics from the supply chain. So um, as sort of looking at the food and drinks material hierarchy, AD is the optimal technology for treating this food waste. What's really important as we look to design the policy is that the bio bags that are going to be used are compatible with the AD process. Um, and I think what's interesting here is that that's both um, that that's mindful of the fact that we don't currently have that post composting stage. So how we make sure that this is implemented effectively. So last slide, um, just to look at maximizing benefits to soil. Um, it's really important that we get a good understanding of the best form of digestate to deliver the maximum benefits to soil, um, the creatures living in it, um, and the plants that are going to be grown in it. So we're working on this on our side to really um, build on our understanding and evidence base here. Um, there are certain complexities with digestate that we really want to understand. So. Um, it is trickier and costlier to spread as a liquid. Um, compost does have that higher organic um, organic carbon. So, you know, there is that carbon sequestration benefit, which digestate does have, but to a much lesser extent than compost. And then um, nitrogen content, nitrogen vulnerable zones, that's something to explore. And also with digestate and particularly in liquid form, the volumes are significant. And so there's the storage question. And I've just listed here a number of um, upgrading technologies available today. And, you know, there's always room for innovation and research to, to build on these and look for new, interesting ways to do this. So I'll end on that and uh, looking forward to any questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Can you see the questions in your question bar or not? Uh, or or, or, or I, I'm the only one who can see them, I'm not sure. Yeah, perhaps not. Um, can you see them? Or, I can see or, or the no, from Marco. Yeah. Uh, that, okay, Mark, Marco, maybe you could ask that question so that everyone can hear yes, it. Yes, yes, please. I have two very brief questions. Uh, are many AD facilities or plants in UK using centrifugal separation to pre-treat incoming waste? I think this may reduce the issue of depackaging, especially food waste coming from mm. the commercial sector. And second thing is not a question, just a consideration. You were addressing a topic of bringing back organic carbon to soil. I may just say that we have very recently, together with a colleague of mine, which is Jane Gilbert, a UK, British. Yeah excellent uh, researcher published uh, a few reports with the, our working group at ISVA about the topic of the role of uh, organic carbon contained in compost and undigested and its positive interaction with soil. Just for further reading, Rebecca. And maybe we could address yeah. it in another webinar. It's out of scope today. But thank you for your last slide touching this topic. Great. Yeah, I mean, um, we're also in touch with Jane Gilbert, actually. She spoke at our national conference. So it's really um, 
yeah, really interesting point for us and something we really want to understand more. Um, in terms of centrifuge separation, I know that some plants do do it. It's certainly one of the technologies, but I think it's not the, the standard here. I think in general, you do have that kind of um, depackaging, um, the word is not coming to me now, but, um, you know, the essentially chopping it up to 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 mm. um separate it in that way so that's a, a real question for us is are are there processes that might need to be adapted um in in to to make this work better and if there are are there going to be costs for ad plants i suppose mm. so it's just something we want to understand more definitely yes Thank you for that. Just for you to know, the Italian sector of our organization is seeing the adaptation of pretreatment technologies in the, future, in the next years as a key issue element. And of course, it is linked to new investments. And so we mm. analyze it from the cost benefit point of view, because we will have yeah. a significant variety of compostable items coming into our facilities. Sure. Yep. This, is a, this is a question I wanted to ask to, to Kathy Nichols, but uh, Kathy has just sent an email saying that she's had to leave uh, for, a, uh, for a COVID-19 um, meeting. So I will ask uh, you, Rebecca, and Jenny, who's coming up, uh, and that is around the PASS uh, 110 standard here. Now, uh, for those of you who are not British, we have a standard uh, which allows um, AD plants to spread the digestate to soil freely as a product. It's called PASS 110. And the the current standard allows on a hectare of land in excess of 180 million fragments of persistent plastic, toxic, persistent potentially toxic plastic, plastic fragments that can be visibly seen, whereas also an unknown quantity of microplastics which cannot be seen. Now, the question is, don't you think there is an urgency, therefore, to get to grips with this? Um, and I was going to ask, um, Kathy, you know, what is the regulator doing about that, especially as food waste uh, collections are going to grow? The um, digestate quality protocols have all um, recently been reviewed and there's been a consultation on it. So that is all being looked at. And I mean, we certainly support that the, um, the plastic limits are reduced. Um, and they, they are actually looking at Completing those uh, right now. So, yeah, just to echo that, actually, if I may, David, um, both the compost and the the AD quality protocols are are up for revision. Um, and you know, in our latest discussions with the agency, they will be taking those revisions forward, and absolutely expecting physical contaminants, plastics, to be one of the the main things that they're concerned with. Um, in Scotland, there has been a change in the end of waste position where they've tightened the, the limits for plastics um, and sites have, have to, had to take steps, but obviously absolutely support the, the, you know, the protection of the soil as the number one priority. Okay, well, thank you. As, as you have, in, have, 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 um, have addressed this there, Jenny, I'm, I'm going to pass over the floor to you. Um, if, if you have anything uh, to add, you have some slides, I see, so that's good. Um, and then I'll come back to you, Marco, for a, a last roundup. Thank you, sure. Jenny. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, David, and, and thank you very much for inviting me here today to, to talk. I'm conscious of time, so I'll probably whiz through things fairly quickly. Um, I just wanted to say I was actually lucky enough to visit some of the sites that um, Marco and Wilbert mentioned earlier last year on the Italy study tour and was very impressed with what I saw. Just wanted to give you a bit of flavour and hopefully not too much repetition between what um, Rebecca's already said. Bit of a flavour of what's happening in the UK. So, according to RAP, we've got about nine and a half million yeah. tons of, of food. Jenny, just a second. We have a, just a blank screen. We don't have. We just have oh. a white screen. We don't have any slide on it. Just a white screen. Hmm. Can you try giving me the screen again? Alison, could you maybe? You're in presentation mode. It's just your. You have a blank screen. Oh. We can see. We can see you're on a, a PowerPoint slide it's just there's nothing on the powerpoint slide <laughs> hmm, how strange i can see everything on my screen 
<laughs> Go one or two slides further, just as a test. Put one or two down and then come back, maybe. Yeah. No, you can't see anything moving. We can see your arrow going across there, but we can't see anything on the slides. No. Uh, Alison, maybe you need to refresh. Yeah. Uh, maybe just close, close, close the PowerPoint and come back into it again, Jenny, perhaps. We can't see anything, it's just a, a white page. There it is. Now, now we can see. Now you can see it. Good. OK, Thank you. great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I was just saying about the food waste arisings. Um, the latest data, according to RAP, approximately um, 2.2 million tonnes of food waste was actually recycled through composting and AD. Um, we've got a number of AD plants and composting sites that are approved to treat food waste. And back in 2014, composting sites actually processed a total of 5.9 million tonnes and the waste fed AD was 3.8 million tonnes. So quite a significant amount of material going through these sites. Um, I think it's also useful to say that um, of the outputs from those, the compost and digestate, about three and a half million tonnes of compost was produced with about 70% of that going to agriculture. In terms of AD, there was about um, just over four million tonnes of digestate produced. And um, obviously the vast majority of that went to agriculture. Um, I won't spend long on the, the regulations. I think we've already mentioned quite a lot of this. You know, we've got the forthcoming resources and waste strategy that's likely to introduce mandatory food waste collections in England. Uh, we've had uh, mandatory food waste collections from um, households and from businesses in Scotland for a couple of years now already. There's various controls that sites have to deal with around the inputs. And I'm sure if, if Cathy was still here, she probably would have mentioned something about the, that the standard rule permits are likely to introduce limits on, on contamination of feedstocks coming into sites. Same with bespoke permits. And as you mentioned, David, we've got our, our PAS 100 and PAS 110 together with the quality protocols that, that make up our end of waste positions, which control the quality of compost and digestate. Um, there's also the, the breath and compliance with that, which is, is um, taking up a lot of time for sites at the moment in terms of figuring out what they need to do. Um, I also think it was quite useful to just mention that um, there obviously is a cost to all this. And, and as you've outlined already, that you know the economics are very different in the UK. Um, I just think it, it's important to say that, of course, anything is possible if there's enough money to pay for it. Just very briefly, in terms of you asked me about, you know, previously about what the cost of contamination is to sites, it is hugely variable. So the feedback we get from members is, you know, for some sites it's a massive issue and a massive cost, and, and for others less so. And um, we estimate for household food waste, so sort of setting aside the commercial stuff at the moment, just looking at household stuff, typically the, the contamination levels are between about one and five percent, but that's very broad brush. And in terms of cost removal, if we're very conservative and we go to the lower end of the contamination, and by contamination I'm talking about um, plastics and other non-compostable or non-digestible materials, so not including the, the compostables. We reckon that it probably costing industry somewhere around about over seven million ton, a million pounds per year. Um, and that doesn't that's just the cost of actually the removal and then the disposal doesn't actually in, include the transportation cost. I've done a bit of work with some of our members trying to sort of get a bit more evidence together on that and um, one of my colleagues has done a case study with an AD operator and they're a fairly small site processing about 23,000 tonnes of food waste. They depackage the material and then the packaging is then washed to remove any excess organics and it's pressed before it's then sent to landfill and that ends up costing at about £156 per tonne of material is not suitable for digestion. So a massive cost to the site and I'm sure anything that we can do to improve that would be would be very welcome. Obviously, um, things aren't quite normal at the moment on sites, so COVID having an impact across, across the country or across the world, but um, I thought it was useful just to flag up briefly that behaviour change has been happening. Um, there's a RAP report published recently showing that the, the 
there have been changes in behavior. So people are managing their food better, they're storing their food better, planning more, using the leftovers better, being a bit more creative in the kitchen, um, leading to both a reduction in food waste, but also an increase in the number of people that actually recognize that food waste is a really important issue and that everyone has a responsibility for food waste minimization. So I thought that was quite encouraging to note. Um, from the, the sort of processing industry side of things, I think the sites have really shown proven that they're adaptable. And I've been really um, pleased to see the col collaboration that's happening. So it just goes to show that we can do it when we need to. Just very briefly to finish up, I want to highlight some of the work that we've been doing as an association. Um, we obviously promote be best practice within our members at all times. We've done a lot of work with the regulators over the years on quality and a lot of work to improve the quality in terms of raising awareness. We've developed some template contracts, we've developed guidance and we've done case studies of um, both local authority collections, but also on-site processing, things that are working well. Um, we've also been working over the past few months on developing a policy about compostable bags and liners with the view to reducing that plastic contamination that you mentioned. And absolutely support it in principle. I think we still need to finalise some details. Um, we're hoping, we've been in discussion with ADBA and we're hoping that we'll be able to come up with um, a joint position. Um, and obviously those details need to be finalised and we circulated to our members prior to, to publication. And that's it from me, really. Just want to to sort of quick whistle stop tour of what's happening. Thank you, thank you, Julia. In the absence of Catherine, I'm going to ask both you, Jenny, and Rebecca a question, uh, which is coming from one of our members, um, and that is that since AD all over Europe copes with compostable bags, when you say that compostable bags need to suit UK AD, shouldn't it be the other way around? <laughs> Um, Rebecca, I'm not sure if yes, you are there. Uh, Rebecca yeah, and Jenny, I, I, mean, I mean, taking, I mean, it's it's a really interesting question. I think so if you look at the Italian case, I think how their industry actually evolved was that they had a composting industry, and then they decided to do AD. So it evolved that way round. We had AD that didn't evolve off the back of composting sites so we do have this situation where ad plants don't have post treatment composting um and ad is the preferred treatment method so we need to make sure that the bags that we use do suit ad um and you know if if these bags can go through a digester and you know, we have high quality um, products going to soil afterwards, then that's perfect. But if we need um, additional processes to deal with that, it's just a case of understanding what any costs might be and making sure that they're considered. Jenny, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with what Rebecca said. I think um, the the industry has evolved in, in maybe a slightly different way. Um, although I think it's important that we in the UK do take note of what happens elsewhere. And absolutely, you know, given that there's a lot of plants processing these materials um, and not having any issues, whether that's removing them for onward treatment elsewhere, whether that's composting or something else, or actually putting them through the process. So um, we've had we've had really mixed feedback from our members, I have to say, about about the suitability of, of these materials, but um, definitely something that we want to look into further. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point that came up in, I think, the Copenhagen case is that a lot of this material is being removed at the front end, and then the fragments that you might get feeding through are then biodegradable rather than plastic. So that's obviously a better situation. And that's, and you know, we, I think, all already agree that we want bio bags. It's just a case of, um, I suppose, choosing the bio bags that, that work, work best with, with our system. On that issue, Bill, but yeah. can I come back to you a second? Because, you know, you, you're treating 
as much uh, food waste in your plants as, as, as more or less the whole UK, um, and certainly more or less England. And I just want to make sure that everyone has understood that the bio bags do go into the digester and do digest in the 30 days of your digestion process. And those are just ordinary one, three, four, three, two compostable bags. You understand very well the question. You, you're asking if the bio bags are going to, uh, to the digestion and that we don't find the, bag, the bags after digestion. That's the question or not? Yes, they, they do digest in the, in the 30 day process of your anaerobic digestion. Yeah, we don't, after 30 days of uh, digestion, we did several analyses and we don't find any biobacks after digestion. So they are completely um, fermented and transformed. So we don't find them back. Um, we, of, of course, we are not going to agriculture, we're going after that to composting, but it's not necessary for the biobacks to be composted because they're already turned uh, into uh, methane and biogas. All right, thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to, um, I don't have any more questions for Jenny and Rebecca here, so I'm going to give Marco five minutes just to have a quick panorama through other collection systems in other UK countries, in other European countries, um, and just a, a quick five minute run through, Marco. Okay, I will try to be as quick as possible. Just give me a second to share the scheme correctly. So, I try to summarize it again with a very simple question. What happens in other European countries and cities regarding the focus is collecting food waste together with compostable plastics? Uh, I try to make a map, oh, which is not complete. It doesn't want to be so. And you can spot immediately a situation where green means no problem, it's done as a standard, and the other colors are somehow diversified. I will get back to that in a moment. Uh, starting from north, ideally, we know that our Nordic countries are, in this case, very flexible. We have seen uh, the case of Copenhagen today. This is in Norway, Stavanger, again, uh, a case where compostable liners are used because they remarkably behave better in terms of separate collection, use acceptance, reducing the amounts of rejects. And again, here they go directly to a biogas or AD facility. Uh, it's a SMIC facility, and here you can see their key numbers just to see them. And again, the digester is, is used for soil mixtures, so for potting pro uh, processes and so on. I think a very interesting case is the one of Austria. Uh, also is one of the countries in Europe uh, which has the longest track record on separate collection and composting. And of course, AD is nowadays a new trend. They, they are national organization, uh, which is a composting and biogas organization. They are launched the Ocean Initiative to eliminate or to ban uh, traditional bags and liners in favor of compostable ones. Uh, regarding the question you made before, the shoppers uh, are all certified according to the European 13432 standard. Uh, the authors deliberately wanted to have uh, liners for um, small bags for food and grocery to be certified and immediately visible to their consumers in order that they know that the second life of these kinds of tools is to be used in separate collection of food waste. And they made a national initiative on that, which resulted in the adoption from their local government. And so again, there's no discussion about that in Austria, you can use compostable liners being made of paper, being made of uh, compostable bioplastics. There are selected cities around the world, around Europe, sorry, which are using compostable liners. I took some pictures from Paris where the collection started relatively recently, if we compare it to experiences in UK or Italy, so in 2017, again, a significant number of households, a good acceptance, and again, using compostable liners. If we move west, we will uh, east, we will find um, Geneva in, in Switzerland, and again, with a similar approach, because it is believed to be extremely user-friendly. And again, one of the important output was a significant increase in bio-waste collection, which means, again, more waste to be recycled. 
Uh, I'm not going to speak about Catalonia, just mentioning that also other regions in Spain, like Basque countries, are relying on compostable plastics, and in that case, very often becoming uh, applying fourth industrial revolution in terms of RFID system applied to trace the collection services and verify by numbers not just by polls, but really by everyday numbers, the participation of households, since you can check and measure who is putting their bio bin on the curbside. Uh, last point, coming back to the more, let's say, critical area uh, in terms of using compostable plastics. Uh, let me spend a few words on Germany. Uh, you might know that uh, in this map you will see different waste management districts in Germany, and most of them in Germany rely on using paper. In reality, there are a lot of waste management districts which also allow compostable liners or a significant number which don't forbid them. What comes out if you survey the German situation is that there are cities which have had very good experiences with those schemes and that banning compostable bags won't help you not to find them into your food waste. And that's the, my, one of my last slides. I'm skipping the case of Munich, but there is a recent result about a German assessment about the quality of bio waste comparing what I abbreviated with waste management district using uh, compostable liners and uh, about 11 not allowing them. Well, the outcomes would be interesting for you because they answered three, um, three questions which I think are important for our speech today. First of all is uh, compostable liners are used by households even in those districts in which compostable liners are not allowed. So in that case, Germans behave a little bit like Italians. So they don't keep totally to rules. Uh, there's a reason for that user friendliness for sure. The second thing which came out of, from this survey is that uh, a ban on compostable liner doesn't work because if you look at those districts which are not allowing compostable liners to be used, well, you end up to having more polyethylene bags into your bio waste collection compared to those districts where compostable liners are allowed. So somehow the, the compostable liners kick off the PE bags from the scheme. And this is a positive result for composting and for AD. Uh, last element, if we look in this case, the focus was on composting. So if we look at the quality of the compost produced in districts which collect, which are presumed to collect with paper only, and those which allow collection to be done with compostable liners, well, it ends up that we have no negative correlation to be found between impurities and the final compost, which goes back to soil, and the use of compostable liners. I make it short, but if you would like to look at the numbers or at the figures, uh, the figures are very clear in that and again show that uh, uh, once you allow compostable liners to, to be used, you still will find traditional plastic bags, but the relative amount to the total bags use is screwed down by the compostable. And I think this is the achievement that all of us want to do. So final slide is, if you want to monitor those kind of things, look where in the world we start to have bans on PE bags and shoppers, because somehow this uh, legislation is a trigger uh, enhancing also separate collection of food waste. And this was my last slide. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to give a world panorama in five minutes, but you did a good job. Thank <laughs> no. You. Thank you. Um, now, I, I just have one or two more questions, which I, I'm going to close uh, the, the meeting with. Um, and that is, firstly, yes, of course, we will share online all the presentations. I ask all the presenters, please, to send me uh, the presentations, and I will share them online uh, in, on our website. Uh, the second thing is, on our website, the BBIA website, you will find a reports page. And on that reports page, a lot of the questions you are asking are answered. For example, in terms of the analysis of uh, the breakdown of the biodegradability of bioplastics, what are the testing methodologies, et cetera, they're all there, um, and uh, these are international standards which these materials have to adhere to. Um, and um, the, the last question I want to come back to, uh, and maybe to, uh, to um, Teresa, if you were there as well, um, just quickly. Uh, Italy, you are already 
ready for 2030, uh, 2023, because you have your virus collections in, in place for Teresa um, and, um, and, uh, and maybe Suzanne in, in, in Copenhagen and uh, Rebecca and Jenny in the UK. How ready, how ready is our waste industry? How ready are our waste authorities for the mandatory collection of food waste uh, across our nations in 2023? Now, I know, Teresa, you can only speak for Catalonia, not for the whole of Spain, uh, but Spain is one example where uh, there is a huge amount of, of food wastes uh, going to landfill and incineration. Um, and and um, Suzanne in, in Copenhagen, uh, you can't speak for the whole of Denmark, but how ready are your authorities, how ready are your governments, what are their plans, do they understand the amount of food waste which they have to deal with? Are you there? Yes. Teresa, uh, or Rebecca, who is first? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I can start. So um, I think there's a real question around um, understanding the volumes of new food waste that this is going to mean. And I don't think that there is a really good, I don't think there's brilliant data on it. So from a planning perspective, I think that's a real challenge for government. Um, and I think in terms of um, being ready, I think a, a huge part of this is going to be about the implementation. And so that that campaign to get um, households on board and ready to do the right thing, because I think if those first stages don't work effectively, people will lose interest. And I think it's really important that it's implemented in the right way. And I think that means having bio bags because people don't want to deal with gross, messy food waste without a liner. And we do need it to be, we, we don't want it to be plastic. So, um, you know, there are certain aspects of all of this that we need to um, discuss and understand better. And, you know, I think it would be really useful to have um, some dialogue between probably some of the BBIA members and um, some of our big AD um, operators to really make sure that both sides really sort of have a good understanding of each other's um, questions around all of this. Um, but from a government perspective, you know, COVID is disrupting things. Um, and But it, it feels like the team is is fairly on track hopefully you know they're talking to us hopefully talking to the right people um but you know covid may delay things i think uh, thank you rebecca suzanne yeah i just need to find the button to <laughs> to turn on my microphone <laughs> um yeah well in denmark we have um situation where we're having a struggle between uh, uh, the private market and the public um, bodies that are handling waste and uh, it means that uh, maybe um, <laughs> maybe it won't be allowed for uh, public bodies to uh, make uh, uh, biogas facilities or plan for um, sufficient uh, capacity um, for treating the bio waste in, in the future. Um, but then on the other hand, we have um, um, we actually have a large capacity for uh, anaerobic digestion uh, in, in Denmark uh, due to the pigs industry or pork industry or what you call it. Um, and that's also why we, we have mostly this wet anaerobic digestion uh, and not the uh, it's not um, linked up to uh, composting facilities or anything anyhow composting in denmark is almost uh, not taking place uh, i mean uh, not in industrial um, scale at least uh, mostly the garden waste is just sorted and the the, um, the, the wood is burned uh, used for energy in uh, various um, power plants and, uh, and and the smaller parts are just uh, applied to farmland uh, for field composting so uh, i think we 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 may be in a different place than you are <laughs> sure 
Sure, sure. sure. Okay. Uh, Jenny, did you have anything to add there just quickly? <clears throat> uh, yeah, just very briefly. I think communication is going to be key to getting it all right, really. It's one of our big asks in our response uh, to consultations with government. You know, without the proper communication for for getting these schemes rolled out, then, you know, it's not going to work. And I think there's lots of studies that have shown that effective communication has a massive influence on uptake of food waste collections and getting all the information about liners and why it's sure. important. To Absolutely. The right yeah. Okay, thank you. I think Theresa Theresa will, will definitely be able to step up and deal with this. If we get well, that right. Uh, it's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Theresa, are you there? Um, Yes, I am here. Did you want to add anything? I, I can't see nothing. I, I see the, the screen black, but it's a yeah, little bit uncomfortable, but okay. We can, we, can, we can hear you. Okay, I think we are ready to implement the collection, because but we need people to be informed about the consequences, because we can't afford sending bioways to landfill. And people has to know that. So we need uh, awareness campaigns, we need to inform people, we need to in, in, involve uh, commercial and business activities because uh, you see, we don't have to, we can't um, ask people unless the other activities doing the same as, as always. So I think Italy, Catalonia, other successful uh, examples uh, show that we we are ready to do that, but we need maybe we have some stories, some successful stories in transforming our um, rest fraction or mixed fraction faci treatment facilities to a bio waste facilities. For instance, we have we had um, a e a AD uh, treatment facility in Barcelona that in the first uh, step. It was a, a bio treatment, a, sorry, a, a facility for rest fraction, but we changed to a bio treatment facility because we know that to, to produce biogas, we need food waste. So maybe we have to, to transform some of our facilities, waste treatment facilities, to a bio waste treatment facilities to have capacity to treat all this quantity of food waste we, we have to collect. But I think we need that, uh, that uh, mandatory uh, decision for sure. European Commission because we have to go there by this uh, way. Because when, when we start collecting and, treat, uh, and, and treating uh, bio waste, the improvement of, of the general Waste management is, is spectacular. Uh, sure. We have to go by there. If not, it's impossible to, to think about other sure. things that go right. uh, in this way. So I think yeah. we have to be uh, ready. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a big advantage people forget about bio waste collection is that everything else becomes easier. Everything else becomes cleaner. Um, exactly. David, is there any, any, anything that you want to add there? Um, I don't have a specific question for you, but any recommendations that you, you wish yeah, to make for the audience? Recommendation, what I can say is that <clears throat> I'm working out for over 20 years in the nitri and the waste uh, uh, business. And um, in 20 years, uh, you saw that uh, a lot of time was invested also by Chic in uh, transforming uh, the, the plastic bags and bioplastics. Uh, we, we reduced a lot of the cost in machinery also in pre treatment and um, you can see that now in, uh, in 20 years from <clears throat> uh, that we had a lot of material that went end up to the, to the landfill it's now reduced to uh, less than five uh, percent uh, we have now a top quality of compost we sell it uh, from prices up to uh, 100 euros the, the, the pelletized compost per ton we have um, biomethane so our trucks uh, are, <clears throat> are using biomethane produced by uh, top quality of organics and um, we see that um, the, 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 the situation of the, 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 our company is uh, becoming an example for, for Europe having good uh, quality of, uh, of bio waste and uh, I think that's a way to go and we need to go that way. Uh, I don't think I have other things to to add, but uh, 
it's possible uh, to have an uh, how to say it um, to work in this way, it's possible to have a very good quality in biomethane, uh, compost, digestate, and, uh, and water. And then okay. There are other things to add. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I know I know I know Vilbert, that I that I always come to 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 see you and and use you as an example wherever you, wherever I go in the world. So congratulations <laughs> on your work. Thank okay. You. Thank uh, you. Mark, did you have any last comment? Just the last comment, uh, without wood waste, you will never get to a recycling society. Uh, we named it uh, Circular Economy in Europe, and we are all technically aware that you must tackle that. Uh, for those countries which are still part of Europe, I must add that without tackling food waste. So I hope my UK friends don't get offended. But if the other countries don't go that way, and since you were asking more than once about gate fees, David, about economics behind that, well, those countries will get infringement procedures, which will mean they haven't invested their waste into AD facilities or composting facilities. They're going to waste their waste, uh, their money into fines. And I don't like wasting money into fines. So just an economic point for closing a comment on economics. So better okay. investing now than paying later. <laughs> well, it's, with politicians, that's a hard sell sometimes. Anyway, I know. Um, I know. I'm, I'm going to conclude and, uh, and thank all the speakers uh, very much for, for being patient, for staying for, for us with two, for two hours. Uh, thank all of you, the audience, for listening to us. The presentations will be online on our website in the next few days. I'd like to thank um, the organizers behind the scenes, Alison and Hector, who have done this for us. Um, and I hope to see you all again in person safe and well okay. after this uh, coronavirus crisis is over um, and look forward to meeting you in person soon. Thank you very much.